Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's program. It's wonderful, especially to see so many students here. Um, I'm Veronica Roberts, the John and Jill Friedenrich Director of the Cantor and the Curator of Day Jobs, um, the exhibition that's currently on view that you may have been able to get a peek at. And before I jump into introducing the absolute wonder that is Sandy Rodriguez, I wanted to share a few words about the show. Um, it examines the overlooked impact of day jobs on the visual arts in this country, uh, by artists working in this country. And it was motivated in part by my admiration for artists and the remarkable ways that every artist I know juggles the challenges of creative practices while typically juggling also other jobs, often demanding ones. And I wanted to recognize this reality and explore it, especially this reality, especially for artists in the US where there's limited local, state, and government support. And a big part of the motivation for doing the show was really also to debunk stubborn myths around artists and around creativity, specifically, and to specifically underscore the, um, the many ways that everyday lived experiences and challenges can inspire creative ideas uh, and breakthroughs. So, I'm thrilled to welcome Sandy Rodriguez to the Cantor and onto the Stanford campus. Um, you'll hear from her tonight, as you'll hear from her tonight, she's had an illustrious day job career as a museum educator. There is pretty much no museum in the greater LA area where Sandy hasn't worked in some capacity, I mean, maybe a little exaggeration, but, um, but she's also worked at colleges, a community hospital, and a vast array of other organizations. Uh, and for almost 14 years, she worked at the J. Paul Getty Museum in the Education Department. And I think, I think of the Getty as a museum sort of slash research center slash think tank. And I think of Sandy as kind of the human Getty equivalent um, because there's no artist I know who has a greater commitment to bringing together people in different disciplines, map makers, conservators, scholars, botanists, healers, and all sorts of practitioners. And it's not just a commitment, it's a gift at bringing people together who can share knowledge in really meaningful ways. Um, I wanted to share this image um, of some of her notebooks, which I was lucky enough to get to page through um, from her various, uh, you know, many years at these different, uh, in these different roles. Um, with drawings and sketchbooks of uh, notes from talks and all the ways that she was being inspired and um, really just a deep knowledge that she took from those positions. Um, such an active learner. Um, and here is the first studio visit where we were talking about uh, what to include in the show and getting to see just the notes behind her process and some of the materials. I forget, what am I holding, Sandy? Was that? I don't even, oh, that's amazing. I was like, what is that? A Western, ant okay, my hand is holding a Western ant antler lichen and maybe she'll tell us why that's important tonight. I can't recall. Um, but, uh, and then here's the work in the show. If you haven't had a chance to, to see next door, here's the work. She'll talk about this tonight. Um, and the show originated at the Blanton and had a slightly different version with some of the notebooks. Um, so this, this is uh, the first incarnation and you get to see some of the materials in the notebooks up close here. But I wanted to say in typical Sandy fashion, she'll be here at Stanford for um, a week and she's conducting research visits, leading workshops with students. And I, her visit here is made possible thanks to our co-sponsors in the Center for Latin American Studies Department and the Art and Art History Department. So I, I especially wanna thank Elizabeth um, Ackerman, Science Ackerman, Sarah Clemente, Hector Hoyos, Alberto Diaz, Rose Salceda, Enrique Chigoya for being such wonderful collaborators with us. It has been a dream of all of ours to have Sandy here at Stanford and Alberto and I were just talking about how we were dreaming about this. It seemed like a long time ago and finally the day has arrived. Um, before I turn the podium over to Sandy, I just wanted to mention again that you can see her work if you didn't have time to take a peek at the work um, tonight. The show will be up through July 21st, and it spans two floors. Sandy's on the ground floor. Um, and I also wanted to share that there is a terrific interview with Sandy in the Day Jobs catalog. It will be coming, the book will be coming out in probably May, um, maybe early June, and we will sell it at the front desk, but um, you can also pick up a little slip on your way out 
uh, with information about how to order it online from Radius Books. There's also some cool postcards if you happen to be a postcard kind of person. Um, but you're going to want this book because I'm pretty sure you're going to want to know about the Secret Art Show Society Sandy was part of at the Getty. And um, it re the Day Jobs catalog reveals all sorts of amazing stories that artists share about how they live their lives. Um, but thanks to Sandy, there are some great shenanigans documented in the book as well. So very important. Um, please join me in welcoming Sandy Rodriguez. I am absolutely delighted to be here with you all tonight. And I just want to say thank you so much for making it out. We're going to spend about 45 minutes just kind of going over the series Codex Rodriguez Mondragon and really focusing in on some of the works that you see in the galleries here. So I want to begin by thanking the Cantor Art Center and Veronica Roberts. We met a few years ago at the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art during a reception and have been figuring out a way to work together since. And so it's really an honor and a pleasure to um, be a part of this extraordinary exhibition and to share space with such amazing artists. So I am Sandy Rodriguez. I am a Chicana artist. I live and work in Los Angeles. I was raised on both sides of the border, born in National City, raised in Tijuana, but I've been in Los Angeles since 1987. I'm from three generations of Chicano and Mexican painters. My grandfather from Cintalapa, Chiapas, my grandmother from Aguascalientes, my mother from Tijuana, so I'm third generation painter. I have been working on the series, the Codex Rodriguez Mondragon, since 2017, when I made that transition from my day job in museum education that was from 1998 to 2016. And so it was at that moment that I had uh, time to really recalibrate and figure out how I was going to conduct my research and what I was going to work on if I had all the time in the world, not just evenings and weekends. So what you have on the screen is the first map. This is Mapa Fronteriza de Alta y Baja Califas. And this series of work really maps resistance to ongoing cycles of violence to communities of color blending the historic with contemporary events. The maps are made with hand-processed watercolors that I create using colonial recipes. It is painted on a once outlawed amate paper that is a sacred ceremonial paper that is made of the bark fiber of various trees from southern and central Mexico. The use of these traditions and materials helps me recover the local plants and pigments and enables the work to promote healing from the current and historic traumas. As Veronica mentioned, I use a lot of various uh, strategies, me methodologies, and consult with a range of scholars and artists and historians and scientists to really pull together rigorous field study, historical and ethnobotanical uh, kind of knowledge to address the urgency of the crisis on the U.S.-Mexico border. So what that looks like is a number of things. So over the next 40 minutes, I'm going to share with you how my practice really works with colonial Mexican codices like the Florentine Codex that you see on the screen, material culture, all of the pigments that I utilize, the role of field study, and you see me sitting on a log in Montezuma, New Mexico, doing some drawings, um, and how I really take the time to explore field study to learn about native plants and ecosystems in a way that allows me to slow down, unplug, and connect with the sites and the communities that I'm working with and, and painting. My archives are contemporary. They are historic. You saw a little bit of me in the studio with my library. <laughs> which has certainly grown since you were there last. Um, my archives are archives of color and plant, mineral, knowledge systems, and relationships with people from a range of disciplines, artists and elders. So one of the goals of my work, having worked in museums for nearly 20 years, 
is to really disrupt the dominant narratives of American and encyclopedic and Western European art collections, to interrogate these legacies of colonial aggression. And I am compelled to create these narratives to engage audiences. So with a background in education, there is this desire and need to do the research and teach across audiences to prompt conversations, to prompt uh, action, and to get people to think critically about what we receive in terms of the museums. I'm motivated by the horrors of the news and to create a vision of a better future. So let's talk about my day job in museum education. So while I spent 1998 to 2016 working in museums, the last 14, as Veronica mentioned, were at the J. Paul Getty Museum. It was there that I honed my research skills and was fascinated by the methods and materials of painting. The collection is Western European, so I really focused on medieval to 19th century European. When I trans transitioned into my full-time art career, I could now free up and go do extensive field study in Southern California in the Western United States. It was during that time that I was taking field study courses in the three deserts of California. It was during that same time that I was at the Getty Research Institute and I came across an incredible text that really changed the course of my work. I was at the GRI and I found a book called The Colors of the New World, Artist Materials and the Creation of the Florentine Codex by Dr. Diana Magaloni. And it was then that I found myself falling down rabbit holes, going into the footnotes, going to recall those books, poring over them, using the World Library, and the uh, Library of Congress digital versions till I finally found my own facsimiles and I could lay on my carpet and pour over them. But at the same time, I'm going into the deserts and I'm pulling samples of medicinal and edible utilitarian plants, I'm filling out notebooks, I'm gathering uh, thunas, I'm processing the colors, and I'm figuring out how to stabilize organic color. All of this culminates into this mapa fronteriza that you saw in the first slide, but I wanted to show you some images from the Great Basin Desert and then show you places where I camped out, how the plants and I kind of were introduced to one another, and what those kind of smaller postcards look like in terms of how they relate into the larger maps. So while I was in the Sonoran Desert and in the Mojave Desert and in the Great Basin Desert, this expanded into the 10 Western states. So I spent five to seven days flying into places with two suitcases, one with all my art supplies and camping gear, and the other with clothes. I'd rent a four-wheel drive and I would follow in a caravan a couple of people, way off grid, no Wi-Fi, no Google Maps, you had paper maps, and you had a shovel in case you got stuck in the sand, right, to dig yourself out. But once you got there, you'd set up camp and had the opportunity to go out and draw all of these specific uh, plants, meet them in these locations, take a nap in the middle of a beautiful uh, area in Arizona that you'll see. But I'm introduced to these plants by their Latin binomials by a botanist herbalist. Then their English common names. Plant names change over time. I wasn't satisfied with that. I needed to know what their indigenous name was before Anglo and Spanish settlement. So it was at that moment that after looking at um, Daniel Mormon's um, Native American Ethnobotany, which is a 900-page book that I pour over, there's an online version, but it's out of University of Michigan, that I had to then figure out where were the other texts prior to the 19th century? Where am I going to find the information? So for my exhibitions, I like to include plant knowledge names over time. So some of the earliest some of the earliest botanicals were really from that early period of 2017 when I'm digging deep into the Florentine Codex, when I'm looking at the actual plants in their ecosystems and, and habitat. So you'll see the name is a Nahuatl, and then you'll see the Latin name for these earlier ones. And so you have the nopal here, and you have my little calavera copter, which is a, an element that appears in many of my works. 
for the past 20 years. Living in Los Angeles, we have more helicopters than any industrialized nation. And we know that they are used to hunt residents as well as migrants. So they always appear paired with native plants in a way that I feel um, allows them to appear and then disappear. Later, as I'm working um, in various communities, I start to find those texts that allow me to understand regional plant knowledge names and histories. So if I'm working in Joshua Tree or in the Mojave Desert, I'm going to look up the Kawiya name and understand the Kawiya uses of plants. So you'll see the different names over here. If, so you'll have the names Hamuchiwa, Alborde Josue, Joshua Tree, right? And so I understand the role of sacred Datura or Momoi based on the histories of those specific sites. If I'm in the Central Coast, there are five different languages spoken and five different ways of working with some of the plants on the Central Coast for the Chumash. But so getting to understand what those names are according to these earlier publications and then consulting with the contemporary artists, scholars, and uh, linguists that are working on the new dictionaries. When doing plant study, we know that a lot of those names are out of date. Plants get reclassified, and information and knowledge is you know, published, but then you have to vet them with the current people that are working on them. So with these that were done for an exhibition in the Central Coast, I had to work with a number of people. But you'll also see, um, some of my favorite plants uh, in this slide, which is two different yerba santas, which have been very, very helpful for respiratory illness. And every time I got, you know, a cold or congested at the beginning of pandemic, I always went to this plant, had a tea, and then I was okay. Here you're going to see a eight foot by 23 inch accordion book where I'm working with a recipe, a visual recipe from a 16th century book for the remedy for susto or trauma and fright. In chapter 10 of the 1552 Colonial Materia Medica Codex Cruz Bariano, there is this recipe. And this text is dedicated to all kinds of ailments from stupidity to people with goatee smelling armpits to government officials experiencing fatigue, to physical ailments like toothache, fever, body pains, but it contains culturally specific um, potions and poultices for things like susto. So the survivors of the 1521 conquista and subsequent epidemics who witnessed so much suffering have a bunch of remedios in this text. And it wasn't till last spring that I actually got into the vault at the Museo de Antropología to see the actual book. I've been working with facsimiles and reproductions and digital versions, but to see the actual thing allows me to think about the material in a different way. And while we can never truly understand the experiences of the people who endured the initial colonial aggression over generations, we can look at some of these texts for traces of how these ailments were treated in the past. And we can read the news and stories and testimonies about families who are experiencing this ongoing colonial aggression in the present. The dehumanization of migrant communities by local and federal policy is something that I track. And it's through research, writing, and art making that the present traumas can be put into context. The past is humanized. Recent violence against migrant children and human rights abuses across the border has a very long history. In our present moment, collective, individual, and intergenerational trauma and fright still requires treatment. But today, it's full of pharma, anti-anxiety pills, antidepressants, sleeping pills. The image that you see on the screen is the mapa of the child detention center's family separation and other atrocities from 2018. Every area that you see a landscape is a place that I flew in, spent a week, camped off grid, slept on the floor, listened to bird sounds, watched the sunrise and sunset, and really spent time slowing down and doing my field research. 
And it's here that you have kind of this layering of history from the past to the present. I'm going to be highlighting some of the strategies for the Remedio for Sisto that you see kind of manifest in a variety of the works. So when you're looking at this particular map, and I'm just going to go back for a second, you see that there is yellow, and that yellow is from a, um, a mushroom that I collected up in northern, like two hours north of here, in Mendocino County. The green is a Maya green. The purple is a palo tinto, which is a heartwood of a tree that grows in Baja and Yucatan, but it creates four different colors. What you're looking at is the outline of the territories that were acquired by the United States after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. So you have this different maps within a map. The lines are drawn in a um, walnut ink, but I created a pen from a great horned owl feather that I found on a hiking trail. So the materials are from the place, the tools are from the place. So it's about real careful observation, the scratching, the smelling, the tasting, the edible plant materials, and thinking about what it means to be creating work at this time. You'll see various elements from the past. Here you have a citation from the Florentine Codex of the Weeping Mothers. And I juxtapose that with the Torneo City, the tent city, where Thousands of child migrants were left to sleep on the floor under those silver emergency blankets that we saw images of in 2018, but we're not seeing them anymore, but it's still happening. Here in the Texas area, I included some images of a family that is enslaved here, and I separated them, including one element of the family over in Texas. And this is a reference to some stories from Texas detention centers where young fathers who didn't know when they would see their families again committed suicide. So he is disappearing here and then his child is left alone. There is a boat in the lower portion that is the USS Emancipation. It's a boat that was used to deport people during Operation Wetback, a campaign that deported over a million people in the 1950s. Another federal policy that some people would be aware of, but it's not part of our education and history. I told you about that great horned owl feather. So I was in Montezuma, New Mexico. I was looking for this uh, area where my father, who had attended seminario in Montezuma, would study and I was in these hot springs and we went up and we were hiking around and all of a sudden on that log that you saw me drawing, there was a big fish and a bird feather just on the trail. So instantly you're thinking, what happened? Why did the bird drop the fish and why'd they lose a feather? Like, what was the story? So I take a picture of the feather, I send it to a um, ornithologist at the natural history with a ruler next to it. I'm like, what bird is this? Everyone's guessing online, what bird is this? He's like, well, it's the right feather of the left, you know, part of the owl, because of course, through measuring, they know exactly which one. So there's my owl, and there's the western antler lichen that you were holding. And do you remember what it smelled like, Veronica? It smelled incredible. <laughs> so sometimes you're processing plants. Sometimes they smell not so good. <laughs> And my studio is downstairs, but I do a lot of plant processing in my small one-bedroom apartment. So you can imagine when you're boiling things that don't smell so good, you want to close the doors and open and put the fans on. But this plant, when you're boiling this, it's just like perfume that smells the whole house. And so I'm doing some research on this. And I was in New Mexico, I was in Las Tijer or in, in Tijeras, um, above Albuquerque, like probably 20 minutes above, and I'm staying at a woman's ranch, and she goes to work, and I'm just kind of walking around her ranch, and there's all this lichen. But you cannot take this lichen from the tree because it's doing its job. It's creating oxygen for us, right? It's processing carbon dioxide and giving us air to breathe. You can only pick it up from the floor. So I waited for the family to come home, and I was like, can you take a walk and like collect some lichen? So I got a bag of it. And in my research, I'll 
read as much as I need to know before I run into the kitchen and start processing it. So this recipe takes 21 days to boil it, agitate it with ammonia or urine. I'm just going to use ammonia. And so you agitate it and you put it under the sink and you're, or sorry, not ammonia, vinegar. Um, and you're going to put it under the sink and you let it become a color. So I was so excited when this became hot pink. By changing the pH levels, you can make it blue, gray, pink. And you find a lot of this material in ancient vessels. So there's a paleobotanist who works in museums that has all these artifacts. And she's like, why is there so much Western antler lichen in all these vessels? So later she discovers that it's used for embalming. It's used for perfume. It's used for dye. It's used for medicine. And so I was so excited to use this dye in my depictions of this particular region. And then I read further. It only works on proteins. So it has to be fur or feathers or silk. So it's not going to work on my cellulose bark paper. So not all experiments um, are going to yield the success that you'd like, even if you spent almost a month working on it and went thousands of miles to go find it. Shortly after that work was completed, I learned about the cases of child migrant deaths. And so in the galleries, you have two of my healers and three of the seven child portraits that I created in 2018. It was December of 2018 when I read the headlines, she died of dehydration and shock. It was the story of Jacqueline Calmaquin, a seven-year-old Guatemalan girl who died in Customs Border Enforcement custody. The story shook me. I wrote it on a piece of paper, I taped it to the wall, but it was too horrible to respond to that winter. I waited till the spring and conducted field study all along the Arizona to Texas border, looking for medicinal plants, sleeping under the stars, hiking canyons and mountains, getting harassed by customs border enforcement. I came home with dozens of studies, like the ones that you saw on the other slide, dug deeper into the kind of uses of those plants, had to figure out what was the element that I was going to include in these child portraits to reference their migration story. So out of seven children, six were Guatemalan and one was Salvadoran. So I chose to use the bird, the Quetzal, in the lower portion by the date of their birth, in the lower corner. But knowing that I'd never seen a Quetzal in person, I had to go work with zoological collections because they don't survive being caged. I had to go and do these studies of these um, specimens, and they were too horrible, so I had to go back and use photos of the real life ones. So I read all of those news stories in English and Spanish. I got as much information as I could. And then working with my dear colleague, uh, Diana Magaloni, she created poems for each of the kids using all my news sources and all of my research. And we put them in the catalog. So you have her text in English and Spanish with each of the portraits. In 20... 19, I co-founded a group called Project 1521, and I convened 10 poets from Northern California to San Diego to fly in or train into my studio, look at the works, and as an educator, we did writer's workshops based on the research and the artworks. And so we would come together and write in response to the research and the paintings, and so we had a big performance at this exhibition. So the poem and the image that you see here was recited in front of the object with musicians playing. We had invited um, activists from the Young Center that worked to train volunteers to help unaccompanied minors that have to go to court. It was a week before the shutdown when this work was on view. It was through organizations like Families Belong Together that I found 
a number of photographs that were different than the ones that were published online. And so I just wanted you to see an image of each one of the kids that I painted. So you have um, Marie Juarez, Jacqueline Calmaquin, Carlos Gregorio Hernandez Vasquez, Felipe Gomez Alonso, Juan de, Lo Juan de Leon Gutierrez, Wilmer Josue Ramirez Vasquez, and Darlene Valle. In your galleries, you have a portrait of Juan de Leon Gutierrez. Each of the titles includes their name. In each of the poems that Diana created, you'll see the information about each child. I'll give you a minute just to read a few of the lines. Make sure that the PDF of the catalog is available um, so that if you want to go through each one of these, you'll, you're more than welcome to. This is the one for Felipe Alonso Gomez, who's eight. He died on Christmas Eve in El Paso. This is a portrait of Wilmer Josue Ramirez Vasquez, who was two. And I have the original studies that I'm still, years later, trying to track down a way to get these to the families. Um, and hopefully that will happen soon. Um, it's just, it takes a little bit of time to work with the lawyers that represent them and to try to get artworks to the families. So in dealing with such heavy content, it was important for me to look for images of healers. So I'm looking at the Florentine Codex. I'm going through the books. I'm working with Diana. We're looking for images of healers who are treating the respiratory uh, ailments that these children died of. So I include um, a portrait of Diana as healer number one for the treatment of Romadiso, which is viral infections of the upper respiratory. They didn't know I was going to paint them. I just said, can you send me a portrait of yourself in profile? And I surprised them and I included their portraits. The second is Nandi Ponte, who is at Cornell University. And so she's harvesting chia in preparation for, again, respiratory issues. And the third is Dr. Ella Diaz, who was at Cornell and who is now at San Jose State. Um, and she is comforting the enfermos with a plant that's for pain of the heart. This was also the year that my mom passed away, so it was a pretty poignant kind of moment um, for me to paint that particular picture that's on view in your galleries. This is another picture that was part of that exhibition. There were 20 some objects in that exhibition. And this is a double portrait. And it's of a midwife who's uh, taking care of a newborn. But I also included this double portrait of Marie Juarez and her mom in the hospital right before she passed. So you see the image from the Florentine Codex. You see the image from the Cruz Bariano. And I married those two images together. That's in the permanent collection at the Bancroft Library. So if any of you are teaching courses and you want to run over to Berkeley, you can pull a number of objects that they have in their permanent collection. This is the big map. This is eight feet by four feet. This is what accompanied the um, child portraits and the healers. And this plots all the locations along the U.S.-Mexico border. And I include all of the plants that are for the treatment of susto in the map. There's 24 carat uh, constellations in the sky. And this is in the collection at the Amon Carter in Texas. Here you see some of those images of the field study that I've been telling you about. 
those little orbs are where each child took their last breath. There is, instead of weeping mothers in this map, uh, images of weeping fathers. So that was a pretty um, intense exhibition, and it was shortly after that that I started working on an exhibition that ended up taking about seven or eight years. Is that true? Something like that. It took a long time. Um, no, I lied. We met in 2018. The show opens in 2021. About like seven or eight years. <laughs> so this is a map that's called Mapa for Malinche and Our Stolen Sisters. And this makes visible the history of Malinche's life story. And so I invite people to locate the elements from indigenous colonial sources that mark pivotal moments from her life. So as an enslaved teen, she was gifted to the Spanish along with 19 other girls. Her survival is documented in records of the period, but the fate of her sisters remains unknown. So there's little red hands that are painted across this map to identify sites where contemporary indigenous women were stolen this year and underscore again this enduring legacy of colonial violence against women and girls. This map draws on the tradition of ancient painter scribes who layer time in history. Each pigment contains the symbolic power. The Maya blue stands in for ancestors. The gold describes that heart sickness that the Spaniards said that they were afflicted by, that they couldn't go home, they had to push on to get all the gold. Uh, red ochre is an ancient ceremonial paint that records history. Cochinilla red is a, from a scale insect and it's used for those handprints and it stands in for blood and some say it's the only color that spirits can see. White is used for Malinche's dress and represents our mother, our sister, our icon. In the cartouche now, I start including uh, numbered kind of events so that you can place them next to the numbers so that there's kind of a visual uh, narrative that you can pull together. And I worked with curators Teresita Romo and Victoria Lyle for quite some time to really refine and focus on those eight major points in her life. And the handprints for the murdered and missing um, women showed up at the end to really pull forth that information. So I contacted MMIW, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women USA, and I requested names of all the women who had been trafficked, abducted, murdered and missing along the border over the past year, just one year. The list was incredibly long and I could only select 19 because Malinche was trafficked with 19 other girls. I Googled mapped those locations. I provided um, opportunities across the map for you to see it. And I painted myself in this little detail uh, with a mask on painting in the studio so that you understood that this was the first map that I created where I didn't travel to go do that field study. So there's no painted landscapes. All of the plants that you see in this map are painted from historic texts. And so here's one more detail where you have the figure in white just kind of showing from her birth throughout the kind of pivotal moments. These are a number of the sketches. Know that because this is a mate, this is unsized paper, you cannot paint a mark and go back over and blend it or erase it. This is a paper that drinks the paint and the pigment in a way that you have to know exactly where it's going or you start over again. So there are 32 preparatory sketches for a single map. <laughs> this is why it takes over a year and a half. And it was um, Camilla Towson and Tatiana Flores at Rutgers University that decided to put up a show last spring. They had all 32 studies, reproductions on view of this. And there were panels and red ochre um, grounds and I, I really had a lot of choices to make. But this is, how the, this is how the research and the process goes. And it was through those almost 20 years of working in museums and that rigorous kind of methodologies of my day job that I apply that into my, my current practice. There is a lot of going back and forth between art history and archaeology 
And as I'm doing this research on the Codex Cruz Bariano, I'm using various sources to understand what those plant names are. I can look at plant names in the Florentine Codex. This is the first time these plant names have been written down. The spelling, even though they're produced at the Colegio de Tlatelolco in Santa Cruz, are written different in two texts. So if you're trying to vet, is it the same plant? It's almost impossible. So there's months and months of consulting with people before I can really comfortably say, yes, that's the one. Otherwise, I have to leave it open-ended. Which brings me to some of the more recent commissions. I've been working um, as an artist in residence with the Huntington Museum in San Marino um, in LA County. And so this is, you are here, Tovangar, El Pueblo de Nuestra Señora, La Reina de Los Angeles, a Porciuncula, Los Angeles 2021. So I started to focus in on place names. When you're looking at colonial sources, you find all these um, logographic or toponyms for place names. And so it was important for me to include the names of each area before Anglo and Spanish kind of settlement. So the, all of the locations on this have very small inscriptions. And this is right when we're just starting to come out of our homes and I'm just starting to, to do field study again. So I got to go out to Catalina Island and hang out with the little foxes and see the flying fish and do a little bit of research on a very sacred um, site for the Tongva community. But you'll see that there's three names for those areas. For Palos Verdes and so on. One of the more recent maps is Rodriguez Mondragon's Federal Indian Boarding Schools of the Southwestern United States and Child Detention Centers 2022. Again, these maps are eight feet by eight feet. There's another monumental um, book. And really, this map visualizes 150 years of the federal government's uh, separation of tens of thousands of indigenous children from their families, their language, their culture, and their communities on ancestral lands where they were assimilated by force in these federal Indian boarding schools. It was just that year in 2021 that a 400-page report by the Department of the Interior finally was published. So I took all of that metadata and put it into QR codes for educators who were teaching with the object so that you could find the exact details and information. So in this map, I've got all of the historic federal Indian boarding schools but I layered them with the Southwest Keys um, Agency, which is still the site of child detention for migrants. We haven't talked about it since 2018, but it is still happening. It's just, they're contractors, it's not the federal governments running these, these sites. So in this map, I only have 114 of the 408 boarding schools. But this map will be extended for an exhibition in 2026 that is the entire U.S.-Mexico border. So I'm always including marine life, real and imagined. You'll see uh, various marine animals swallowing U.S. Customs Border Enforcement, marine vessels, squid taking down other things. I've researched so much of the Customs Border Enforcement uh, helicopters, marine vessels, that now on my Google uh, sidebar, they're like, join the Customs Border Enforcement team. <laughs> and I'm like, Are, do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> do a little research. Um, so yeah, Southwest Key Detention Centers are located in, in purple. And then you have a lot of my field study sketches from those seven different states that, where I conducted field study. So those are those small kind of vignettes that you see. At the Huntington, we have an installation of all the colors that I work with. So it's kind of my studio on steroids. So you walk in and you can see all of the minerals in various forms, processed, unprocessed, big historic images, my sketchbooks, uh, samples of paper, so you can really understand 
how does color look on cotton paper versus parchment versus amate? Right. I did all the research, wrote the labels with a wonderful team. So the names of the colors are in English, Spanish, Tongva, Chumash, Nahuatl, to really underscore again kind of how we relate to color and what is the symbolic power of color according to image making in the Americas for the American art wing. This is the latest installation, and this is a pronostico number five. This is a four by eight foot panels. And I'm really using pronostico as kind of this reference to climate change as colonial aggression. So book 12 of the Florentine Codex is of the war or of the conquest, and it begins with a fire that burns for a year, and that's the first kind of omen. So I decided to create a series of fire paintings considering we live in California with all of the annual wildfires as kind of uh, another omen of another cycle. Here is a show that just recently closed. This is my Mapa of Revolution and Resistance in Central Califas. And this is really going back 200 years to a major revolt in California that not a lot of people have heard about. And I bring it back to um, that particular moment in 1824 in February when the Chumash community formed alliances with a number of groups in the surrounding Southern California area, locked the priests in the chapel, burnt the missions to the ground, freed their family members, ran off into the hills and fought the Mexican military for six months before being captured. Yet this revolt is not monumentalized. We haven't heard about it. And so I did a couple of years of research and I created a biombo. The biombo is a form from the 17th century in colonial Mexico that typically tells of the conquest and has kind of idyllic views of Mexico City. So I kind of inverted that triumphalist message and really think about ways in which I can subvert these forms and these materials. The back is all painted in hand processed charcoals from my wild, from my, um, not wild, from my fires out in the desert. So this charcoal is black and sparkly. And then I inlaid about 150 pieces of abalone that I chipped, drilled and glued into this biombo. And that's a view from Santa Cruz Island. So the Channel Islands was a very important and critical kind of trade route for communities prior to the invasion. And so I got to go out into this research island and do about a, works, a, week's, a week's worth of field study um, and collect materials and spend some time under the stars and do these nocturne views, really thinking about the kind of tradition of American landscape painting. Here's a couple more views of that installation. And I just wanted to wrap up and say that you can always look at my website to see the current exhibitions. There have been seven exhibitions on view so far this year. I am delighted to be in the Day Jobs exhibition and to have the chance to work with Veronica Roberts. So thank you so much. Hey, Sandy, thank you so much for your wonderful lecture. Um, I'm curious about how much access you have had without any problem to documents, especially indigenous documents. Um, sometimes the bureaucracies of institutions make it a little hard to go through. I personally went through arguing with the Bibliothèque Nationale, trying to see some Pre-Columbian books. I never. I was writing a, uh, an essay about, about um, the destruction of the pre-Columbian books in the library of Texcoco in Mexico City in in, in 1521 uh, for LACMA for a, that exhibition of uh, that. I don't know. You might have seen it. The um, Road to Aztlan. They wouldn't let me see them because they say a Mexican stole pre-Columbian books, oh, oh, no, pre uh, indigenous manuscripts on, from the Bibliothèque Nationale. <laughs> and in the first place, they were stolen out of, Me or smuggled out of Mexico through collectors who sold them in Europe, etc. It's, it's a long story. The, the thing is, um, I told them, those 
manuscripts should be returned to Mexico so people like myself could see them. Uh, so, uh, of course, they called me like a month later when I was done with my essay, so I wasn't able to see them. But they have a Mayan book, the Codex Paris, and maybe the only Aztec book, pre-Columbia, not post-Columbia, post-conquest, but pre-conquest, the Codex. Um, it, it's um, Borbonicus that, that is there. It's almost in pristine condition. And I was wondering about the Codex uh, Cruz Mariano, uh, because I saw that one in Mexico City, and it's beautiful. There was an exhibition of codices, including the Mayan Codex in Mexico City, back, I think it was 1922, or 20, I think 2021 20, or 2022 20, that I saw it. And um, I understand that book was brought from the Vatican to Mexico City by the Pope in 1993. So it was wonderful to see that. I wish they returned the uh, Codex Florentino instead. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry, this is uh, more about your, your lecture than me talking about it. But I'm curious because I, I relate to a lot of your work and, uh, and I, I love how you focus on the issues of contemporary times when indigenous people are having these uh, tragic encounters in the border. And uh, so, what has been your experience getting access to documents that are very important for your work and for the community at large uh, uh, that is interested in history? So I think it's important to say that it's a, a, a labor of love and that there's objects that we just are dying to spend some actual time with. When you're working from your laptop, or when you're working with reproductions, the material is not the same. You don't get the power of the material. You don't get to understand kind of the relationship of the maker to the surface and how the scale. Um, with the Codex Cruz Baliano, like, I had found some of the most atrocious translations <laughs> that I could not believe the translations. And I was working across a variety of institutions to find 1950s, 1940s translations. I learned about it's being uh, rediscovered in the Vatican in the 20s. It's finally being repatriated, but I never had seen it. And it took me years of sending letters and getting people to send letters on my behalf and having to be there. And it's just something that you keep asking for and eventually it may not be in your timeline, it may be after the fact. <laughs> Once you actually have that moment to spend time with the real object, there is something that you know, is really powerful and allows you to think about it in a new way. But it's something that now um, I can dedicate time and resources to when I'm doing a residency or when I'm doing field study to drop in and just follow up with people. But it's, it's a lifelong uh, passion and something that I don't see <coughs> will ever end. It's wonderful. Um, I just wanted to jump in for a second while we, um, but I also was really struck by, so the, the slides that you showed, the images that you showed of the Huntington and a couple other places you showed um, the, the pigment and how you arrived at it and also even the, you know, the owl feather and really, like, I think that there's so much of an, not every artist, art, I find that so many artists use materials, um, I'm drawn to artists like you who use materials in such meaningful ways and so thoughtfully, but not every artist would also then share sort of the pigment itself and the histories. And I feel like there's an educator in you there, like you're, you're, you're sharing the tools and you're really, you know, like the way you talk about the amate, the bark, and just the layered, of, but like the way that you share that visually as part of your practice, I think is really interesting. Um, and do you want to talk even about the blue color? Because you chose the Maya blue is it Maya? Um, for the wall behind the portraits of the three children and the two healers. So like, can you talk about some of those decisions as artists of what you show with the artwork and, and that color choice, for example? Sure. Yeah. As I started reading um, that text that I was telling you about Colors of the New World, 
there was something that was really transformative and where I understood that color, even uh, going back to 16th century, has a conceptual kind of language that is understood by contemporary audiences of its time. that doesn't translate to us. But that color, the Maya blue, is a color that is synthesized in the third century. And it's a fusion of a polygorskite clay and indigo to stabilize a plant-based color that is used on ceramics, that's used in fresco, that's used in body paint, that's used on a number of painted supports. But this color is, I think for me, really kind of uh, symbolic of creation itself because you're taking underworld materials and solar realm materials and you're fusing them. And because these kids are all from that region, it was important for me to have that on that dark brown or medium brown amate and to really give it that vibration, to allow for the eye to really receive the subtleties of those browns, you had to have that, that blue to pop. And so including, as we did in the earlier um, installation, some of those uh, materials so the audiences could understand that this is not, you know, Amazon purchased paint, this is not, you know, art store modern synthetic color, this is color that has a symbolic power that is from a specific place. Great. Any um, other questions? Yes, in the front. Uh, it's very inspiring, everything about your work. And I'm, I, I'm, now that you um, explicate how you go about creating, I realize that you have really a very sort of active relationship with nature in which you are inquiring and you are learning and and that's really incredible but i yeah i, I wonder because you, the proximity with nature that you have uh, reached is likely the one that they had when they were using these pigments right in antiquity so i i i just wonder how you you know were able to discover this on your own with that curiosity of traveling and really relating to nature in a very unique but also um, wise way because I really think that it maybe is the same relationship indigenous peoples, you know, when they were painting around. Uh, so I just wonder about that dialogue you have with nature, if you could just elaborate a little. Well, I think when you spend uh, almost 20 years working under fluorescent lights inside of a cubicle, <laughs> you're like, now do I get my paid week off? And now can I go outside? And you're like, okay, I can go outside whenever I want now. Um, to be able to switch the kind of timetable of I work five days a week and I can go outside on two days a week, was one of the things. But as a kid, I was growing up with a large family and two of my beautiful sisters are here. And we did a lot of traveling um, in a green VW bus and spending time and did a bit of car camping. But there was something that I was missing um, that slowing down and that really kind of getting to a natural pace of time. Because when you have your career and your day job that keeps you on a very kind of fast pace, like you need everything now, now, now. It's like, no, you don't. There's no art emergencies. We're all going to live. I was saying there are no art emergencies, too. But I was, I'm so glad you asked that question, because I was also thinking about the way in which your subject material is so heavy and emotional. And I was also thinking about the, you know, you talked about, um, you talked about healing a lot in the materials, in the properties of pigments, but I was thinking that your process of being in nature also seemed like it was a healing for you. I mean, how do you make that work? You can't, you know, I, I it just, uh, so I was struck by that, thinking about the need for you to be in those spaces. And, and the nerdy joy you're obviously getting from like discovering the weird lichen. And I bet even when it doesn't work out that you can put it on the paper, I know you're still loving it and you're totally, I still have it, and yeah. you got to hang out with it and smell it when you were in the studio. Yeah, it was pretty, yeah. it was it smelled good. I, yeah, but yeah, just thinking about that is really interesting too. Hi, Sandy. I have um, s somewhat of a related question to the previous one that was just asked. You know, when I first met you, it was before you started using natural dyes, um, 
a matte paper. You were actually making paintings, I think, out of oil and acrylic on the 1992 Los Angeles riots. Um, and so, and I, I love, you know, the direction you've gone. These are, some of these are artworks I've taught here at Stanford. Um, and I've also had that experience in the classroom where just sharing the context, you know, I'm crying. And sorry, <laughs> just thinking about it like automatically makes me want to cry. But I was wondering that like transition from, uh, you know, like the co now common paint materials to indigenous um, natural dyes, paper, tools. What was it exactly that inspired that transition? And you had mentioned before, you know, quitting or ending your job at, at the Getty, but, um, but was it something you were always interested in? If you can just uh, give more info on that, that'd be great, thanks. So working with an old um, Western European collection, a lot of the narratives within those objects from antiquity to 19th century are not necessarily accessible for K-12 audiences. I was the education specialist for teacher audiences. So how are you gonna get a fifth grader in South LA to care about King Louis XIV's tapestries? <laughs> so I had to go into material culture and figure out what is the hidden history of these materials? We can talk about labor. We can talk about the history of these pigments and how they were produced in plantations and you know moved around the world and then were symbols of power and had very kind of loaded symbolism. So while I was still working in the museum, a lot of my classes were about methods and materials of painting. And so after a number of years, I realized I had a pretty solid grasp of the Western European paintings, methods, and materials. When did colors get introduced in the Spanish, French, Dutch traditions, right? When do these materials move around to various workshops, and what does it mean at that time? When I was able to flip the script and work for myself and then teach in my spare time, I said, well, here's my moment. How do I take this opportunity to research methods and materials of the Americas. What is specific, what is symbolic, what is meaningful, and what can complement the content in terms of the form and the material. And so that's when I slowed down and I started processing cochinilla by hand, realizing that the preparation of these pigments that are mineral and plant-based can transform my mindset. And I'm not just going into a drawer and finding a tube and sticking it on the palette and working with it. I'm reflecting on what I'm painting, I'm processing it myself, and I'm really in dialogue with the painters that came before me of the tradition of the Americas. So that was really kind of that, that transition. Thank you so much for your you know, just sharing all this with us. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the Malinche painting and the, and the 19 sisters, our sisters, you actually put it that way. Uh, and, and it seems to me that, I mean, one of the things about how, you know, how do we grasp this past, you know, of a figure. Uh, so Camila Townsend, you also said that she has this beautiful biography of Malinche, if anyone wants to read it, it's incredible. And uh, can we really make those women alive again? the 19 sisters or the Malinche herself? I mean, can, can we really grasp them or is it just imagination, imagined lives and, and how do you, because you also said they are also today, not, not just in the past. So I'll tell you that the conversation began in 2018 when I learned that um, the exhibition was in its kind of beginning stages and research and process. And so it was over those years between 2018 and 2021 that I got to work with the curators, read all the text by all the scholars, understand what has been kind of out there circulating for generations and generations. We have kind of all of these different moments within history and where Malinche is standing in for 
various kinds of figures. So the title of the exhibition was Trader Icon. Um, I can check I can't remember the whole title right now. But understanding the ways in which Octavio Paz had been you know, kind of using that figure and the way in which various um, scholars have worked with that figure, it was important to understand that feminists in the Southwest, feminists in the United States, have worked with that figure in various moments and to destabilize the ways in which we talk about Malinche. I mean, there were even cases in like 2020 where the LA County Sheriff was calling one of the County Board of Supervisors a Malinchista, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so it's how do we reconsider this idea that we have kind of placed on this historic figure and think about what it means in the contemporary moment. Um, I, I think we have time for another question. And while we're, uh, I want to let somebody other than me um, ask it. But I did want to, I, I was struck by um, thinking about one of the questions that Rose asked, which I really appreciated about um, you know, your switch to the indigenous materials and how was that timing-wise with your job at the Getty. But I was thinking about the way that you were both informed by those amazing conversations and your work as an educator and all the conversations, the access you have to like, you have like dial a conservator. You can call like any conservator, you can call any, anything, you know, because the Getty is just amazing, that vastness. But I was also thinking about the way that you are, and other artists in the show too, um, sort of rejecting and pushing against some of the narratives and histories that are embodied in those collections. And I was thinking even about map making and how you talked about sort of colonial violence and your mapping the contemporary, you know, sites of trauma and, and, um, and but also thinking about how map, it, map making itself has been used to harm. And so I think there's something really, I just keep returning to the ways that you're, um, yeah, and I'm sure you saw at the Getty, I imagine that there are so many historical maps that um, that I love the way that you're also sort of reclaiming that form and the way that map making or ge geography can be deployed and sort of weaponized against people and you're using it as a form of, of healing and awareness and education. So I think that's just really something I was struck by as you were presenting. Um, so I guess that's not a question, which is terrible that I did not ask you a question. But <laughs> again about the ways that that job wasn't just um, informing and in like influencing in this beautiful, perfect, positive way, but the ways that you were pushing against a lot of what you were seeing and feeling a need. It seems like you felt this need to write, to tell these stories that are not being told and yeah, and, and the materials, um, to take those materials that that's so now important. I can't imagine you going back to oil painting. Right? Can you? I can't imagine. Well, the, the Biombo is done in oil paint, oh. but uh, but it's basically pigment in a binder is your paint. Okay. Yeah. With some abalone. A lot of abalone. abalone. And me. mica. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Do we have one last question? I have one. Oh, there's yes. more. Yes. Oh, yes. Great. We could ask both. <laughs> Hi, Sandy. It's so nice to meet you. Hello. Hello. Um, I got to see your show in LACMA two years ago, and it was really so spectacular. I'm so happy to have you here now at Stanford. Um, but I wanted to ask you about your archival practice, because it, it really strikes me how much research goes into your work, both within institutional archives and then also within the natural landscape, um, and kind of an embodied practice. And I'm wondering if you consider your own artistic practice as a form of archival work as well, um, and how that maybe kind of figures within these also sort of hybrid faces of institution, like both anti-institution and institution, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I'll tell you that I'm creating a 21st century Chicana archive. <laughs> and I gave a talk at the A La Triennale in Mexico City last year specifically about my archive. And so because I've been trained in museum methodologies, I'm working with um, a variety of platforms to not only have entire uh, kind of systems that log every citation with every source, but I also work with a platform called Artwork Archive that creates a searchable database for scholars and historians that are working with you know, my work to be able to pull object files with full citations and histories. 
and that will catalog and be able to pull everything with said plant or everything with said figure. Um, and so while I'm collecting my own archive of color and my own um, library, I'm also creating assets for people to be able to search and pull those threads together. Because one of my um, official positions with the Getty was for about six years of it, I was the museum's librarian. So I managed a library of 4,000 books and I deaccessioned a bunch of resources, video and audio, and so I take very seriously the opportunity to create a Chicana 21st century archive. Um, I was just curious, uh, you mentioned the violence of climate change and it, it made me think a little bit about whether there, um, I just wonder if there's any natural materials that you found referenced as being historically used that you either haven't been able to find because you're still seeking them and they are hard to find or that perhaps are no longer available. So that's an interesting question. So Maya Blue is a very specific polygorskite clay from the Yucatan with an indigo that's fused together. I was able to find a fabricator, not fabricator, a pigment uh, company that made it in Texas. I ordered a couple of bags of this. I'm running out. They no longer exist. I've contacted various pigment distributors and they don't have it. I purchased some from another uh, company in New York that got it from Berlin. It is not my own blue. <laughs> not even close. I, um, through the work with um, various colleagues and working with Diana, um, her daughter went down and made some, but I still don't know how to make it myself. Because <laughs> you have to fuse clay with a plant. And so I don't know if you have to precipitate the plant into a dye first or what temperature, but uh, Kida did. And so I have a little bit, but that's running out, so I'm using it very sparingly. <laughs> There's also this blue from the Pacific Northwest that's only produced in the cone of a spruce tree. And so when the cone of the spruce gets buried in a lemonite or an iron-rich sand, I don't know how long it takes, but once you crack it open, it's this bright blue that you'll see in artworks in the collections of like Seattle Art Museum. But I've never worked with it. I got one cone once, but it's too precious to work with. It's like the lapis lazuli of the Northwest. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds amazing. I did see one hand up in the front row earlier. Do you still? I was going to talk about materials and the sourcing of them. Um, I know specific plants. Um, whether it's um, disease that grows on them or decay or something that comes off of a plant or I don't know, how do you source your materials just as you're kind of explaining now? But also, how, do you, how did you figure out this process for yourself when you first started making this way when it comes to resource making the paints and the color, or were you doing uh, the mapping at the same time of mixing colors, or do you kind of do everything in a, I mix my colors and I think of the palettes that I want depending on the feeling that I want the work to have, or are you already working based off of the idea? Basically, like, like are you more conceptual rather than, um, I'm just gonna go in and start a map, is what it's I'm always kind of It's always, um, a new story or something that I'm, I'm really having trouble with understanding myself and how do I explain this and then prompt conversations around it. Mm -hmm. Then it's, okay, let me go think about this deeply, but let me go do some field study in the area that I'm trying to address it. Then you meet all the plants and you do a bunch of research and you're like, oh, that one plant is not only medicine for this and it's used for building that, but it can create color. Mm -hmm. Let's go try to make it, right? So then once you get the color from the place, from the plant, from that region, then you decide where it's going to go in the map. But the act of processing color is something that has taken me a very long time, and I'm continually learning. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, 
it was last year I got to work with uh, a Zapotec textile artist, Porfirio Gutierrez. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to get in this class for years, but he only does like two classes a year and only 10 people. So I finally get over there. And so I'm learning according to various traditions, the relationship to plants, the relationship to ecosystems, and that you're not processing color, you're kind of treating kind of your larger relationship with place and communities. Yeah. So I was going to talk about like alchemy as well. And would you consider yourself an alchemist when it comes to your material? A little. Creating. Yes. Because <laughs> I know a lot of your work is, a, I mean, your whole practice is research based. So in storytelling and archiving. And yeah. My name is Erika, by the way. It's an honor to be here. So nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. On that note about alchemy, um, I think we will wrap it up. And thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you so much for all of you for being here.